This is the story of the first all airborne topographic mapping survey ever completed. Here you see surveyors working on foot in a remote area, such as the Bowser Lake region, in which this history-making survey was conducted, fighting dense underbrush, plagued by flies and insects, and laboring under heavy packs. The method was arduous, slow, and uncomfortable. At the higher levels, cliffs and almost insurmountable obstacles, such as shale slides, deep ravines, and glacial fissures, limited progress during the short survey season. Supplies were maintained by trains of pack horses, and base camps were numerous, as they had to be established very close to the outlying setups, known as fly camps, in which the instrument men lived while engaged in their normal routine of instrument readings, the taking of photographs, and constructing the rock cairns or beacons on the mountain peaks. The Bowser Lake area lies approximately 100 miles northeast of Stewart, near the BC Alaska Panhandle boundary, and is an area of most rugged terrain, being a veritable maze of moving glaciers, rock slides, and crags to an elevation of over 10,000 feet. It was here that the Topographic Survey Division of the British Columbia Department of Lands and Forests successfully carried out this total airborne survey. Alf Slocum, Chief of Topographic Surveys, points out a detail in the plan of operation to Colonel Jerry Andrews, now Director of Surveys and Mapping for the province of British Columbia. These men, together with other experts from the divisions concerned, prepared for every eventuality. Later, they sought the advice of Carl Agar, Operations Manager of Okanagan Air Services Limited, holder of the 1950 McKee Award for the greatest contribution to aviation in Canada and a pioneer in the technique of landing a helicopter at high elevations. Slocum discusses air photo coverage with Bill Hall, Chief of Aerial Surveys. The full cooperation of every survey division is absolutely necessary. An air surveys plane races across the airstrip. The air photographs it obtains will be a vital link in this successful modern survey. The observer navigator guides the survey plane to its destination, where he will use special instruments to keep the aircraft sighted on a true course while photographs are being taken. Gliding past rugged snow caps, the plane gradually climbs to the elevation required for the particular photographic information it must obtain. Photographs are usually taken at elevations varying from 7,500 to 20,000 feet. The plane is equipped with an intercommunication system so that the crew can work in perfect coordination. The aerial camera sees the mountains below as a great carpet of jagged peaks. Electrically controlled, fully automatic, each magazine contains 120 exposures, 5 inches square. At 17,000 feet above the ground, using 3 and 1 quarter inch focal length lens, each negative covers approximately 25 square miles. For tri-camera photography, two additional cameras are mounted, pointing to port and starboard. And all these cameras are exposed simultaneously to obtain sets of photos covering from horizon to horizon. The valuable photographs secured, the plane returns to its base. With a glance at the windsock and an all clear from the control tower, the pilot loses no time making a landing with his converted Anson bomber. These finished aerial photographs will facilitate operational plans, are carried in the field and used continuously until the final manuscript is complete. They also form a valuable permanent record in the air photo library. Yeah. 
Every instrument is thoroughly checked before leaving for the field, and each instrument man coached in routine. Jerry Emerson, chief of the field party, inspects each instrument before giving it his okay. Once on the job, it must last the season. Each instrument man practices his reading technique under careful supervision. Elmer Curtis, assistant to the party chief, makes sure his transit is ready to read main triangulation angles. The wild DKM transit provides fast, accurate reading. It is most important that each booker follows the same routine. Work must be neat and accurate at all times. Specially designed topographic cameras get their share of care. Knowing the feel of his camera before leaving for the field is important. Each camera has its own quirks that must be watched to ensure good photos. The camera also fits the transit tripod. This operation, which here looks simple, may develop into a chore when fingers are numb from icy winds blowing off the glaciers. Regular airline services were used to transport personnel from Victoria to Vancouver, thence via Prince Rupert to Stewart. The door closes on a modern aluminum version of the hiking boot. This giant of the air is only one of the planes available for speedy travel. The facilities of several airlines were used. Trans-Canada Airlines to Vancouver Airport, Canadian Pacific Airlines from Vancouver to Prince Rupert, and Queen Charlotte Airlines from Prince Rupert to Stewart and by charter flight on to Bowser Lake. Prince Rupert is passed and the plane continues up the coast. British Columbia, Alaska boundary near Stewart slips by. Over the town of Stewart, the last point of civilization for the surveyors, the seaplane banks for a landing on Portland Canal. Waterborne freight services to Stewart were used for heavy supplies, shipped well in advance of the expedition, and to maintain supply when time permitted. The supplies are loaded aboard the chartered QCA Norseman. At least once each week, this aircraft made the 100-mile trip from Stewart to Bowser Lake, bringing in supplies and personnel whenever necessary. It transported to the base camp all the aviation gasoline and oil required for the operation of the helicopter. The plane flies easily, carrying its heavy load across a trackless wilderness of rugged peaks and receding glaciers left over from the Ice Age. It would have taken months for hundreds of pack horses, teams of packers, mountaineers and trailblazers to accomplish what this plane could do in an hour or two. The valleys and low-lying areas were floating muskegs. The lower slopes of the mountains were being crushed under the weight of hundreds of millions of tons of ice, which precipitated avalanches of rocks down the slope. Two months is the maximum open season in this area, the remainder of the year, the snow varies in depth from 10 to 30 feet or more, even at the lower altitudes. The plane's destination is this remote base camp at the north end of Bowser Lake. A basin of ice-cold glacial water is used for washing purposes as helicopter pilot Bill McLeod gets ready for lunch. Few of the survey party trouble to shave, hoping whiskers will discourage to some degree the many mosquitoes and flies. Freddy the cook even turned out lemon pies at the base camp, and occasionally these superb delicacies were sent up by helicopter to the mountaintop camps when these were supplied with standard rations. The surveyors enjoy a hearty meal of moose steaks. Again, the seaplane arrives on Bowser Lake with its cargo of vital supplies. Thus, although otherwise isolated, this camp, by means of the two-way radio contact with the airline, is only an hour or two from civilization. At 
the improvised floating dock, all hands hustle to unload the air cargo. The men at the base camp receive their mail from Jerry Emerson, chief of the field party. Even the men in the mountain top fly camps received their mail weekly. The plane heads back to the outside world. When larger lakes are encountered, this link collapsible sectional boat, weighing just under 100 pounds, is the answer. Dismantled, it fits readily into a plane or helicopter for transport and two men can have it ready for use in a few minutes. Each section fits into place and is held rigid by a locking device which will not open unexpectedly. This particular boat can be used with an outboard engine, a five horsepower motor being the maximum needed. Being very light, it rides the waves like a cork, but its beam provides the necessary safety and four men can be transported readily. The stern is the last piece to go on. It is made particularly sturdy as it must absorb most of the engine shock. Finally, the extra heavy waterproof canvas cover is drawn over like a skin and burger cord clips, which hook over rivets on the hull, hold it rigid. Oars propel the boat on short trips and the motor can be attached for use on the longer runs. The floating dock, used for the seaplane berth, served many other purposes, one of which was to transport the drums of gasoline from the seaplane landing beach to the steep rock peninsula used for the helicopter airfield. A one-manpower motor. Peeled poles formed a skidway on which the drums of gasoline and oil could be hauled to the helicopter landing field. A cargo net at the end of a rope and manpower made an efficient hoisting mechanism fueled with moose meat and lemon pie. When 10-gallon drums were used, it was found more practicable to pour the gasoline right into the helicopter through a strainer funnel. Pumps and other mechanisms proved to be time-wasting, fuel-wasting, and no more efficient from the standpoint of cleanliness. This delicate rotor assembly is so perfectly balanced that a 25-cent piece placed on the end of a rotor blade will tip it. Each part of this machine was rigidly checked and given the most expert mechanical care after every flight. A flying bird could shatter this fragile tail rotor. Alf Slocum and Jerry Emerson used the helicopter luggage rack for an open-air office as they discussed the relocation of survey fly caps. This was like playing a gigantic game of chess, where every move counts and flying time is at a premium. 300 flying hours was all that could be put in by the helicopter before returning to Vancouver for a major overhaul. Again, the air photos proved invaluable in choosing new campsites from which triangulation readings could be taken. Under discussion is 12,000-foot Mount Patello, with its rock slides and shifting glaciers. To move eight survey teams from peak to peak over a 100-square-mile area and keep them supplied was no mean task. Sometimes a fly camp can be moved twice in a day. Another may remain static for a week or more, waiting for weather to lift off one peak so that a reading could be made. Every passenger is weighed in the clothing he will wear. With gas tanks full, average payload at the higher altitudes was about 210 pounds. Freight could be carried in excess of this figure if less gas were necessary or when lower temperatures gave greater air density. The 
the 178 horsepower Bell helicopter warms up and takes off to carry out the mountaintop camp moves decided upon by the survey field chiefs. The lower elevations glide by as the machine soars into the sky like a modern magic carpet. The ridges are worked for the advantage of updrafts wherever these can be found. Vibration is an accepted characteristic. Looking down from 3,000 feet on streams and gray rock, then close by a mountain waterfall. Barely missing a sloping ridge with the rotors, the pilot builds up an air cushion for added lift at high altitude, then works close over a ridge taking advantage of updrafts. This is truly flying and requires instant action to avoid mishap. Easy flying is found up an alpine valley, then better conditions located along another ridge. Carburetor ice is a danger, and if manifold heat must be turned on to counteract this, sufficient power may be absorbed to make landing impossible. Also, the last fraction of horsepower often may be essential to clear a ridge. A sudden rise in temperature of the outside air above standard can prove hazardous, as the helicopter hovers by increasing the pressure between the main blades and the ground. Carl Agar pioneered this type of flying, and the pilots personally trained by him now fly helicopters in the mountain turbulence and changing weather conditions as a matter of course. A flag is dropped to check wind direction and velocity for landing. These flags are attached to pointed sticks, weighted with a discarded food can filled with concrete. A few of these assemblies always being carried in the machine. They made possible smooth, perfect landings such as this. A tent is taken down and the rock ballast is removed from inside. This was used to prevent the camp from being blown over the 2,000 foot precipice on which it was perched in the only safe location where an avalanche would not sweep it away. The helicopter takes off with a minimum load of one surveyor, his sleeping bag, and a small quantity of food. The surveyor's helper and instruments remain with tent, bedding, and part of the food. The tent and instruments are moved next, then the helper with his essentials. Thus, if the weather closes in before the move is completed, both men are provided for for several days. The pilots, through fingertip control, grabbed onto every safe upward movement of air and used this to advantage up until the last instant, often making a change of maneuver a fraction of a second before these air currents develop as a downdraft. Flying with Agar or his pilots was far safer than hiking. They were scientists at this difficult operation and left nothing to chance. Wherever possible, when a man was present at a landing spot, the pilot was assisted by hand signals so that the wheels could be accurately placed, clear of rocks. No time is lost in unloading supplies. The pilot revs up for a takeoff. Maximum power may be required to lift the machine clear. At high altitudes, pilots prefer taking off from a ledge or ridge, so that if there is any tendency to sink, there is always sky beneath them. Jumping a 1,500-pound helicopter over a precipice into air too thin to support it is not a circus stunt. It is a calmly calculated, accurately executed flying maneuver, made possible by expert training and countless hours of practice. The machine barely clears a lower ridge. A flag fluttering at a survey fly camp 10 miles away is the next destination. The helicopter will be there in as many minutes. A foot, the trip could have taken days. The surveyor on this peak will be jumped across to another mountain top, 
to take transit readings while the weather is clear. A few minutes saved now avoids two or three weeks delay, waiting for clouds to lift. Although the pilot has made one check on this landing spot, and it should be an easy landing, he buzzes the area a second time. Usually, a helicopter cannot hover at high altitudes, but must make a straight approach, breaking to a stop with the rotors at the last instant. However, the cool air coming off a glacier, with its consequent greater density, and a strong headwind made hovering possible at this mountaintop landing. His instruments having arrived, the surveyor gets to work quickly to take triangulation readings as a storm is closing in. Photographs taken in panorama with a special topographic camera are a valuable aid in the office plotting. In rock, a hole three inches deep is drilled for the bronze plug. In loose ground, a 30-inch pipe post is inserted. The penalty for unauthorized removal of these is seven years imprisonment. When each station is completed, a permanent marker such as this is cemented in place for future use. On peaks, a rock cairn is constructed, accurately centered over the bronze plug as a beacon to sight on with the transit from other similar stations. In timbered country below the skyline, a triangular shaped beacon covered with white signal cotton serves the same purpose. The base camp station maintained two-way radio communication with the Victoria office, all survey fly camps, the supply plane, and provincial and Dominion government weather stations. In more level sections, photography is not possible, and aneroid barometers give the elevation. Two men leave on a planned all-day hike. They travel in pairs to provide an added check, but mainly because one man is not sent off alone except in emergency. Air photos permit positive identification of needed elevation points. The helicopter wheels were equipped with plywood shoes, making landings and takeoffs possible in swamp or snow. When landings were to be made in tall swamp grass, the surveyor would jump out with a machete. The machete was used to slash down the grass in a small area, and when the helicopter circled back, the surveyor would guide the pilot by hand signals so that the tail rotor could be placed accurately in the cleared area. An error causing the light balsa tail rotor to strike the dense grass might shatter this delicate mechanism. Where bush or hard hack was encountered, the surveyor descended a rope ladder. A low hovering 20 feet from the ground at low altitudes is possible. The weight swinging pendulum-like below makes the operation very hazardous, particularly should the wind change direction or speed. The descent completed, two sharp jerks on the rope ladder was a signal for the pilot to circle away. Again, an area was slashed to accommodate a tail rotor so that a landing would be possible. Once again, the base camp makes a welcome sight for the pilot. Landings and takeoffs build up pilot fatigue more than actual flying. Worsening weather cancels flights, and Colonel Jerry Andrews and Party Chief Emerson employ the time to advantage in planning future operations. Within minutes, the mountains cloud over, and a rainstorm isolates the surveyors on the peaks as the helicopter stands by at the base in its rain wraps. 
Within the tent, a computer plots triangulation readings. These five map sheets were completed in one season by 20 men. By the old methods, 50 men could not have completed one sheet. Colonel Andrews' kit is placed on the helicopter as his tour of inspection ends. Mr. Helicopter himself, Carl Agar, warms up the machine and tests his controls. Colonel Andrews, prepared for any kind of weather on his 80-mile trip out to Hazelton, where he will contact other field parties, walks slowly to the helicopter. A chapter in the history of surveying in British Columbia is completed. Under the most difficult conditions, there had been inaugurated and carried to a successful conclusion the world's first all-airborne survey through the ingenuity and planning of the surveyors and the cooperation and experience of Okanagan Air Services Limited. The flying carpet glides by the foothills of the mountains it has conquered as it soars into the blue sky to pioneer new fields of aviation with Carl Agar before returning to this area next year. The winter's program commences with the laying of the slotted templates. This produces the exact position of the center of each aerial photograph in correct relation to the control obtained in the field during the summer. A separate template is cut for each photograph utilizing old x-ray film. That part not needed is cut away to facilitate handling. Each template fits into place and finally hooks up with its four neighbors, the whole being anchored by the control points. Here the expert is putting in contours with the aid of a stereoscope. Black lines indicate 500 foot intervals, red 100 foot intervals. All lakes, creeks, rivers, swamps and other features are inked in and then reduced to manuscript scale and plotted using an epidioscope. Attesting to the accuracy of the finished manuscript in the finest detail, the signature of surveyor Jerry Emerson, chief of the field party, writes finis to the summer's work of the Flying Surveyors.